first and foremost, of course, from my side, also good morning um, and welcome to my presentation today. My name, as you heard before, is Annalisa Klages, and I work for an international NGO called Inspiration Arts for Humanity. So in the upcoming approximate hour, I will tell you um, more about the organization, about the, its aims, about what it does and why it does what it does. And because it's an, an, an organization that wasn't founded in Germany, I'm gonna speak about Israel, I'm gonna speak about Uganda, and then I'm gonna actually come to the German part. So it's sort of a threefold um, presentation that I'm gonna to give to you today. Um, just briefly, and you heard a bit about myself, but for you to understand who I am and why I came to stand here today. So the arts have always sort of been my kind of thing. Um, as a small child, I started painting a lot. I did creativity, as many, many children do. And by the time, usually about 13, 14 years old, most young adolescents stop um, performing arts saying um, mostly in the fine arts sense, many of them continue to do uh, music or theater, but usually they stop pursuing the fine arts. That has several reasons which are more psychological and art therapeutic than they are relevant to today, so I'm not gonna start talking about it. If not, I'm gonna get off topic. Um, but I continued, and as you heard before, my degree or my bachelor's degree is in art therapy. And so as an art therapist, I have always believed in the capacities of art for personal growth and for empowerment and for finding one's own voice. Um, and sometimes even in finding a reason to be, a reason to continue. Um, but it wasn't until my master's degree that I did in, uh, in Israel in social work with a specialization in crisis and trauma studies that I understood that art can do more than just work on an individual level, but it can work on a societal level, and it can work as an actor for cultural diplomacy. So it can be used in a very systematic manner to sort of catalyze social change, to empower cultures and subcultures, and it can most certainly raise awareness. It can also give voices to the people that aren't hurt and aren't seen. And so it was these thoughts that ultimately made me decide to join Inspiration Arts for Humanity and become part of their team. I wanna start my presentation today with this painting that many of you have probably seen. I don't know, it looks familiar, yes. So Guernica from 1937 is definitely one of the most famous paintings by Pablo Picasso. Um, but more interestingly for me today, it's not that it's a, a, a very amazing piece of art, but the story that is behind this painting. As you may know, the painting was done by Pablo Picasso at the time, it wasn't even in Spain, he resided in, in Paris. And it was a response um, to the bombing of the Basque town in northern Spain of Guernica by Nazi Germany in the support of General Franco, who was then the, um, the sort of leader of Spain and drove Spain into a, a very, very brutal civil war. So Guernica was definitely not the first politically motivated piece of art but it was a very outstanding one because it was displayed internationally, it traveled around the world, and it made people aware, to begin with, that there was a civil war in Spain. People didn't know that before. And it's not without a reason that today a copy of this very painting is put up in front of the entrance of the Security Council in the UN headquarters in the United States. As much as I believe that it's not for, uh, without a reason, that in 2003, when uh, Colin Powell, then the uh, four-star general of the US Army, went and um, gave his speech on starting a war in Iraq, the painting was covered up. And the reason for why they did that is because according to Powell, it was inappropriate to speak about a war in Iraq 
with the 20th century most iconic protest against the inhumanity of war as his backdrop. So when we speak about you know, the power, what art can do, what it can display, I think this is a very powerful image to sort of start. Of course, there are many other examples as well. Um, there is, even though in more recent years it has become um, a, a corrupt and, and very um, capitalistic oriented institution, but there is the Sistema um, of Venezuela, which was intentionally originally founded uh, to be an orchestra to empower young children um, that lived on the street. Um, so now I'm going to start speaking about Inspiration Arts for Humanity. Inspiration um, is an organization that was founded by a man called Dr. Mike Naftali, who is a social entrepreneur and has been an activist for over 40 years, a social activist in Israel. Now he's a co-founder of several other organizations and served as the director of um, um, a, an organization called Elem, which uh, works with underprivileged youth in Israel as well. Over the course of his year, of his long time of experience and working in the field of, of social sciences, social activism, and social entrepreneurship, he found that the common red threat in the activities that were the most successful were the arts. Was it using morals, doing graffiti? Was it through theater workshops? Was it through music? It appeared to be that the activities that had the last most lasting effect where people were able to meet one another, not based on stereotypes, and sort of engaged with one another was when there was a medium between them. Now that medium can be sports, and many times it is sport, and as we've heard in the previous uh, presentation, the Soccer World Championship in Germany in 2006 had a very big impact in also uniting the German people and sort of making them get a notion of what it feels like or what it can feel like to be German. But the arts do that as well. And they do it in a very um, non-confrontational and very empowering manner. So, um, so Dr. Naftali started to emphasize more in the arts in his work. And eventually, as he was using the arts more and more and more. And when I speak about the arts, I don't speak about fine arts or theater or music in particular, but I speak about the, the array. I speak about all the arts. It can be poetry. It can be um, video art. It can be graphic design. So eventually, he understood that there was a need for an independent organization that would focus on, on the one hand, execute activities, but on the other hand, also do build the theoretical foundation, build the knowledge, um, train people, make them leaders and make them experts in the fusion, in a way, of the fields of the arts, of um, social work, social sciences. And all that together um, can be a very important and very driving factor when we speak about cultural diplomacy because if you look at the action in itself, it brings together people from different backgrounds, be it nationally or internationally, and um, it sort of brings them, it creates a connection between them. Um, and as Ms. Müller said before, dialogue is a very, very first, very important first step um, in bringing about any kind of, of change whatsoever. So Inspiration sees itself as an international and cross-religious organization with a humanistic approach, which means that we, at Inspiration, we first and foremost see people, and we want to work with people, and we want to assist people to be proud of who they are so that they can reach out and help other people become who they want to be or who they aim to be. Um, our target population in the first instance, many times are artists who have um, a social mind who are social activists, but they can also be organizations, institutions, 
Um, they can be representatives of the private sector or uh, academic institutions. But ultimately, of course, we want to help individuals and groups, marginalized groups in, uh, in societies as a whole and subcultures in particular. Um, the German government recognizes artistic and cultural initiatives as the so-called third pillar in German foreign policies. Um, it builds a foundation for stable relationships, so they say on their website, and fosters a dialogue between people. Art can be an actor in worldwide conflict prevention. It can strengthen the inner European integration, which we've heard a bit of in the previous presentation as well. And it can preserve the cultural diversity of the world, which, and it was sort of brought up when we had the discussion on flags. I think it's very important for us to understand that, you know, with a, in a globalized world, we have different cultures and we are different people and we come from different backgrounds and it's very important and it's fine and it's wanted that we keep that cultural heritage. Now that doesn't mean that we need to close off, but I'm convinced or the inspiration we're convinced that people who are truly aware of who they are and where they come from can open up and they can engage with others a lot more easy because they're well aware um, of where their cultural sense is. Um, the organization in general is built on three pillars. Um, their education, knowledge, and practice. Now I think they explain themselves as they are, um, and that's why I choose to continue with the next one. So knowledge, and I already mentioned it, is a very important aspect because we're talking about a field that even though painters and artists have been sort of tiptoeing on it, is something that until this day has not been widely recognized in academics, um, nor in research. So what we find as an institution, um, similar actually to the, to the idea of what stands behind the foundation of the ICD Academy, is that in order to be able to promote what we believe in, we need to have a theoretical foundation. We need to have knowledge. We need to know what we're talking about. So we started um, building interdisciplinary centers. Um, and because we're a young organization, you saw it in a previous slide, we were founded in 2009. Um, we collaborated with the Makerere University in Uganda to build an interdisciplinary center. Our aim there is to enhance the professional development of every person participating in the program. Um, it sort of, it's located in Uganda, but for strategic reasons. Because Uganda, as you know, it's located in East Africa, it's in the heart of Africa, also the pearl of Africa, a very beautiful country. But politically, it has been very, uh, ever since um, the, the brutal dictatorship of Idi Amin has been over, it has been relatively stable, political-wise, and you can very easily travel to the neighboring countries. Um, you can easily travel to Kenya and to the south, to Tanzania. So, like, um, strategically, it's a, it's a very good location, if you want to say, to reach out to other places. Now, what we do there um, is mainly research and is working with local NGOs such um, is, for instance, Streetlights Uganda, which is a very small local NGO um, founded by four artists who work with street children in the capital to empower them, to give them an education, and to get them off of the street during their spare time. Um, but we also focus on building the, as I said before, the theoretical knowledge, and therefore we collaborate with universities at this point mainly in Israel. Um, so we have student exchanges with art schools in Israel. Um, we have an interdisciplinary course with a master's program that I myself uh, pursued at Tel Aviv University. Back then we didn't have it. Um, and in the future we course, on, uh, we p we're planning on expanding this 
also in collaboration with German universities um, or with other European partners, but I will talk about that once I get to the German part. Um, the center was officially opened last year in March with uh, our first international conference on art, volunteering, and social change, which was held at Macquarie University. When it comes to the practice aspect, for the time being, we have three main projects, uh, which the first of it, the activity center in the Jordan Valley, the Jordan Valley is in the northern part of Israel, and there we focus on small, very pinpointed, uh, specific projects with the local community. The local community is a mix between Arab and um, Jewish Israelis who live there, um, and we we foster or we um, our aim, so to say, is to promote coexistence in that region. Um, then in Uganda, the Brit Global Change Makers is a volunteer center where volunteers currently from Israel and from France come for a period of three to six months to uh, pursue volunteer services to get to know the local environment, to meet one another, and to strengthen their intercultural, interreligious uh, relations. And the last one, which I want to uh, will present to you in a very brief video, is called the Rana Choir. The Rana Choir is a sort of a, a lived definition of what inspiration is about. It is a women's choir that was founded in, in the Arab uh, city of Jaffa, south of Tel Aviv. Um, and it currently holds 20 women who are Jewish, Muslim, and Christian of faith and who come together to provide a safe space for women's voices, to foster intercultural dialogue through a shared creation. And the creation is, of course, their singing, their voice, and their music. They want to express their sentiments, which is positive, which is negative, which is fear, which is love, but which is also very, very, of course, heavily um, connotated by the ongoing conflict everyone there is suffering under. And for them, it is also the representation of coexistence and how that can work. So, how can I play this? How can I play this?
So maybe because we are a small group, um, you can sh share some of the thoughts that you have, maybe something that it provoked inside of you, and then I can tell you a bit more about the choir if you want to. So usually what they do is all of their songs are in Arabic, English, and Hebrew. That is the, the first thing, and then they choose um, mostly the songs that I know, they are either very close related to um, the Arab traditions, the local Arab traditions, or old Hebrew songs, Jewish songs. Um, or in this case, it was clearly politically motivated. And it was a song that was originally written um, by a woman whose name I forgot, but it was um, during World War One. And um, they rewrote it. So it's songs that are closely connected to their cultural heritage, if you want. And then that's translated into, if they're Arabic, then it's translated into Hebrew and English. And if it's Hebrew, then it's translated into English and Arabic. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, the, the message is very clear. There is um, a strong position in the empowerment of women who are worldwide still marginalized today in many, many societies. And so they want to sort of make their voices heard. And that is also how they choose their songs. So the Rana Choir is one of the, is a choir that op operates sort of under the umbrella of inspiration arts. Um, and in my opinion, it's a very beautiful manifestation of what art can do um, when it comes to bringing people from different religions and different cultures together. Usually what happens during their performances is that after a performance is over, there's always the room is open or the stage is open for discussion. And many people, the audience and the women of the choir engage in a, in a conversation. <coughs> when it comes to the educational aspect of uh, inspiration, and now I see that Esteban is gone, see there? Okay. <laughs> because maybe he can help me in a minute. In what? I have another clip that I would like to show, but it doesn't uh, support my format. Where is it? Um, it's got to go. That's a p no, no, no. Yeah, it has to go out because it's not in the presentation. Somebody has a Mac? Nobody has a Mac here? So I have a solution. Okay. Okay. And um, yeah. So in the meantime, I'm just going to continue to talk like this, I suppose. Um, one of our educational projects is called Art Leads Change, which is an artist in residency program. Now, when you talk about art for cultural diplomacy or art for social change or art, anything art that is related to the social sciences, you're going to make very, very many artists very unhappy because they see themselves as artists and artists only. Um, and there is a notion of art for art's sake saying that art doesn't have to be politically motivated. It doesn't have to be a tool. Art in itself is so powerful and so strong that it stands on its own. 
And now with our program, Art Leads Change, this is exactly what we're using. We work together with artists who do their work and who um, display their work and just through the work, kind of like Picasso did with his Guernica painting. The message is so strong that it doesn't require any explanation, any words, any discussion. So while sometimes we use art as a tool to encourage a dialogue or communication or, um, or, or foster a connection between people, many times it's just the art itself that can stand on its own two feet. Um, another educational project that I'm hoping I will be able to show you a clip. Um, it's called Muse International. Now Muse International is a four-year educational project which is designed to be three years studying and one year practical implementation. What's special about this program is first of all its location because it's located in Uganda and second of all its target population which is refugee population residing in Uganda. Today when we talk about refugees and we're talking about a refugee population, especially in Europe we tend to focus on the if influx of refugees coming onto our continent. But we're not seeing that 85% of worldwide refugees do not come to first world countries or so-called industrialized countries, but they flee into their neighboring countries or they're internally displaced. So, of course, Uganda, as I said before, is a um, relatively stable, very politically stable country. It's sort of a magnet for many um, uh, people coming from the neighboring countries and seeking refuge. In the past year, since March of 2016, there have been over 800,000 South Sudanese refugees who have entered Uganda. In addition to that come refugees from the Congo, from Burundi. There are still uh, refugees residing in Uganda from Rwanda, from Eritrea, and from Somalia. So you have a very, very diverse refugee population. And while Uganda has a very progressive refugee law and has been very welcoming to uh, many, many refugees, of course, there is conflict. Of course, there, is there are clashes. And because Uganda, as a developing country, has a growing economy, but the economy cannot absorb the influx of people coming. So this program is designed to give talented young individuals the opportunity to not only become artists, but also entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs at the same time. Because we see and we find the need not only to bring qualified people onto the Uganda's job market, but to bring people who can build their own enterprises on the market, who have the know-how to lead an institute or lead a small company, because otherwise there will, no, um, there will not be much growth in the industry, which is much needed, especially when we talk about the refugee observation. Now the question is, why do we choose art for that? Because if we want to teach people to become entrepreneurs, then we could also just you know, send them to a different school and they would become uh, industrial leaders and they could build their own startups and that would be much more interesting economically. But what we're doing or what we're trying to do is to not only focus on the economic side, but also on the cultural side. We want for these people to carry their cultural heritage and to be able to live with that. We want for those people to be empowered and to have the tools to empower others. We want to train people to not only become leaders but social leaders and social entrepreneurs who find a way to give to other people what they have been given in a similar way. So unfortunately, the video is not working. Yeah, 
Yeah, you, you need the Mac. That's me. I did it on my. I don't have a Mac. Just continue. It's see the problem of coding. Yeah. <laughs> it would have just been very nice if I was able to, sh to show the video now, but if not, I'll just continue. Yes. I mean, if anyone has questions, you can always ask them in the meantime. Also, for clarification, you're always more than welcome. Um, so now I talked a bit about the Israeli part, I talked a bit about the Ugandan part, and now finally I'm gonna come to the German part because after all we're talking about uh, cultural diplomacy in Germany. And after the center in Uganda and after the center in Israel, um, since we see ourselves as a global network of people who have the same vision, and so we decided to connect the loose ends um, and enable with another center in Germany for more partnerships on a national level. Inspiration Germany was founded in 2017 as a response, you can say, to the influx of refugees coming to Germany and the inner cultural or international um, tensions that came with it, so to say. Uh, many times we see, and this was mentioned also in the previous presentation, that the discussions are being led in a black and white manner. It's either uh, like this, or it's exactly the other way. You're either with me, or you're against me. So, as you know, in, in, um, in diplomatic work, we're not trying to convince ne necessarily the other of what we're thinking is right and how we're better but we're trying and we're aiming to understand where the other one is coming from so that we can find a common ground uh, for dialogues, which is what we're doing and what we're trying to do. Um, Germany today holds a very diverse society that is... Yes. It's working? Yes. So I'm gonna stop and we're gonna watch a video. Change. 
Since 2009 up to now, we have been able to train more than 180 students. So this school really helped me a lot. I learned that not only that people with money are the ones that can start business, but your brain and the nature around you, you can do very many things out of it. I'm proud of this group that it helped me out. I never knew I could be there how I am now. If you educate a woman, you have educated a nation. from the bottom of my heart for the future you gave us, especially me. I think <coughs> the future looks very bright. So, thank you very much for helping me out here. So, this was to show you an idea of what the Muse project look li looks like. Um, as you heard in the video, it has been up since 2009, and in the meantime, we have trained about 180 students, who some of them now work as artists, some of them have started their own businesses, and some of them even moved to other countries. I know of a few, of a handful, um, that are now working and living in Tanzania. If you have any questions, again, just feel free to ask. So I was mentioning, I was talking about inspiration in Germany. And the reason for why we did this decided to move to Germany or open another center in Germany. Now, as I said before, um, as, a, as a growing network and as a network that is working with something that is not widely recognized, it is very important for us to gather the people who have a shared vision and to make us all come together so that we can work together. Because otherwise, there will be a, pit, uh, a piece here and there will be a bit over there, and without something that is connecting all the dots and parts and loose ends, it's most likely going to fade away in the sand. So this is why we decided to create this network and to gather the people or the institutions, the organizations that operate on that regional or national level and to bring them together for like a global, national, uh, worldwide, if you want to call it, movement. Um, we are firm believers of bottom-up development, which means that before we're going to start aiming big, which of course we talked about finances before. Um, in the previous uh, presentation, we've also heard aspects of you know, financial, finances always being an issue. Of course, as a nonprofit, we always have to think about where does our money come from as well. And as a newly founded organization, we're not gonna go out and we're not gonna receive a lot of funds to start an academic program if nobody, as long as nobody knows who we are, what we're talking about, and whether we actually know what we're doing. So we're starting with small-scale projects, which are implemented locally, together with partner organizations. We always work with partners because we believe that if you have something, a mutual goal, it will always benefit everyone. And you can work more, 
you can work, be a lot more qualified. You can intensify your work. And most certainly, you can get a lot further than if you do everything on your own. So the projects that we have, or the projects that we're aiming on implementing, always have a connection to both Israel and to Uganda, because that is where our other centers are at the moment. For the time being, we're working on the implementation of a project that we call Creative Connections. Creative Connections sees that there is a problem in uh, issues of racism, in growing racism, in prejudices of the other, and the lack of understanding who the other is or may be, where he or she comes from, what he or she believes in, and why he or she acts the way they do. We see the so-called single story narrative um, that you have probably heard of or know what I'm talking about when I say single story narrative is something that we find very common in very many people um, in the German society today. So our aim is to work with young people, young people above the age of 16, mainly because at the age of 16, you're already old enough to express your ideas and to express sort of your identity as a bit, but you are young enough to be flexible and to if directed, um, be open-minded about what is going to happen and about other people and their stories. So with our project, Creative Connections, we want to enable youth from different sectors of German society to meet other people, to meet other youth from different sectors of the German society. And with that, I mean, Society is, um, of course, a big word, but there are very many cultures and subcultures, and they do not interact. Many times they don't. So we're thinking or we're planning on finding groups, on collaborating, on collaborating with uh, civic society organizations, with churches, synagogues, mosques, but also with uh, institutions that work with imprisoned youth um, that they have special programs where the, the, the young criminals actually don't live in prison, but in, um, in like a home where, they, where they're being um, guided and supervised. And of course there are people as well. And there are very many times victims to uh, prejudice and to racism and they are excluded from society. And because we want to look at everybody and bring everybody into the picture, we open up our stage for them as well. So the method for this program, or this project, is to identify eight groups of various sectors, which I previously mentioned, and then bring artists from Uganda, from Israel, from Palestine, and here from Germany to lead workshops, where groups come together, two groups at a time, and they do an art workshop together. Now this can be the fine arts, this can be music, this can be theater, dance, it can be video art, you name it. They're not only guided by the artist, but also by a social worker, because after all, if two um, parties that don't know each other come together, there is always potential for conflict and for tension, and that needs to be resolved in a very professional manner. If not, obviously, a project like this can backfire easily. Um, these groups, or these newly formed groups, will implement the workshops, and eventually everything will be presented. It will be documented, it will be used for evaluation, and it will be a means of you know, something that is carried on by the participants, because they have now gained an experience. They have now met people from other sectors, and our belief is that the more people will know other people from a different part of the culture, the more they will communicate that with their own friends and their own families, 
um, and the society will become more open as a whole. And with this, I'm going to end my presentation. Um, I thank you very much for your intention. If you have any questions, please go ahead.